Let's take a trip back a long time ago. No, way further than that. You've just entered the prehistoric ocean, but instead of seeing little trilobites or primitive fish scurrying around, you're instead face to face with creatures way, way larger. Tentacled apex predators longer than giant squids are drifting past you. Turtles over 4,000 pounds are cruising by, and normal fish are now, well, anything but normal. This is the world of prehistoric marine gigantism, a type of gigantism that most people aren't even aware of since it happened hundreds of millions of years ago. But unlike deep sea gigantism, prehistoric marine gigantism covers everything in the ocean, even in reefs and shallow water. And oddly enough, most of these prehistoric giants didn't even get big for the same reason. Many lived in completely different eras and never even knew each other existed, yet they all got absolutely massive. Why do we continuously see giants throughout almost all eras of prehistoric oceans? And which descendants of these giants are still alive today? To understand what might just be the oldest form of gigantism, we first have to take a look at one of the weirdest examples of it, Endocerus, the largest of the orthocones. And I know what you're thinking, that this thing couldn't possibly have actually existed, since it looks like it stuck the world's tallest dunce cap on its own head. Endocerus weren't even squids either, but they were cephalopods, hence why they have tentacles on the bottom. But believe it or not, these things were apex predators in the Ordovician period, which is really weird, since it looks like you could take them down with a pencil sharpener. But of course, the only reason they were able to be apex predators was because of their sheer gigantic size. Most people agree that the longest Endocerus reached up to about 20 feet in length, with the majority of it being their giant pointy shell. A few other estimates say even larger orthocones, like Chimeraceros, reached over 33 feet. But those estimates aren't widely supported today, and most think the max size they could have grown to would be about 23 feet. It's hard to say, because we don't actually know their real length since they lived, like, millions of years ago. But what everyone does agree on is that these creatures were big. Compare these to giant squids, and if you don't include their ridiculously long trailing tentacles, the majority of a giant squid's body only reaches up to around 15 feet. Endocerus's hard shell isn't just squishy trailing tentacles adding onto the length stat, it's real animal mass. But who would win in a fight? Well, keep in mind, these things evolved in completely different time periods, with giant squids existing since only about 5 million years ago, and Endocerus being 470 million years ago. But for the sake of the hypothetical, let's take a look at them. Endocerus has a massive shell that a giant squid would likely not even be able to break through. They were incredibly heavy too, likely close to 700 pounds. But if you're imagining a fight where Endocerus would be flying through the water at 100 miles an hour like a harpoon and go straight through the giant squid, that likely wasn't actually what they were doing. The shell is mostly used for protection and buoyancy control, and unfortunately not acting as a super epic living javelin. Even if giant squids couldn't break through their shell, once it gets to the soft part, the fight becomes much more equal, as each cephalopod would just start clashing beaks versus beaks. But of course, Endocerus wasn't known for being the most agile, especially with that giant shell on its head, so it would have to somehow get a grab on the giant squid to be able to deal any damage. And with giant squids being some of the most intelligent invertebrates in the world, they'd likely be able to stay out of direct grasp from Endocerus. Unless Endocerus was packing an extraordinarily larger amount of muscle than we thought, it would likely lose. And even if it was much stronger than we thought, the giant squid would still likely be able to escape something as clunky as this build. But this clunkiness is actually the same reason why Endocerus got so big in the first place. In the Ordovician oceans, nothing else was fast either. There were no sharks, no marine reptiles, no lightning quick predators zipping around the water, and definitely no giant squids. Everything was slow, simple, and honestly kind of awkward. And in an ecosystem full of sluggish early animals, size alone was enough to make you untouchable. You didn't need speed and you didn't need agility. You just needed to be too big for anything else to mess with. Its giant shell helped protect it from smaller fish nibbling on its soft head. But the biggest thing it helped defend against was other Orthocerus. Since these creatures were the apex of their time, the only real predator at that time was themselves, all drifting around trying to eat each other. An evolutionary arms race, but literally just amongst each other, was pushing them to grow larger and larger. 
and with all Division C's being full of easy life to eat, there was no shortage of food for them. Unfortunately, their ridiculous looking shell is actually ridiculous, and is likely the reason why they went extinct. When other life forms started growing larger like early sharks, this giant shell suddenly became a disadvantage and made them predictable targets. A body that looks this awkward is actually just awkward. There's really no way around it. While apex predators of their time, their design simply couldn't compete when hyper-agile sharks and other animals started appearing. And you might be thinking, okay, but apex predators are always big. But here's the thing, land predators didn't even exist yet. Nothing was walking around eating things. There were no dinosaurs, no giant reptiles, not even early land vertebrates to compete with. The ocean was the entire stage, and every major predator on Earth lived on it. Predators didn't even really exist on land. And on top of that, the ocean gives giants a huge advantage for gigantism. Gravity barely affects them down there, since buoyancy holds up most of their weight, which means marine animals can grow to sizes that would be physically impossible on land without their bodies collapsing. And so when the swimming orthocones started fading out, something else had to take over that top spot in the ocean. These were the Europterids, also known as the biggest scorpions that ever existed. And following along with the marine gigantism effect, they were absolutely enormous compared to scorpions today. The largest of them, Jacolopterus, could grow over 8 feet long, which is definitely bigger than you. But why did these guys also get so big? You might think it's because of high oxygen levels, but that didn't really happen until the Carboniferous, millions of years after Eurypterids were already reaching giant sizes. Their gigantism wasn't about oxygen at all, it was also about an arms race. Once the old orthocone predators started declining, the entire ecosystem basically turned into a free-for-all. Europterids were suddenly competing with other Europterids, early fish, and a range of new, evolving prey species. And when everything around you is getting tougher, faster, and more dangerous, the only way to stay on top is to scale up. Bigger bodies meant more strength, more reach, more power behind their claws, and a massive advantage in shallow seas where half the ecosystem was trying to eat the other half. By the time the Devonian rolled around, the oceans were full of heavily armoured fish called placoderms. Everything was evolving thicker plates, harder jaws, and better defences. And when everyone around you keeps upgrading their armour, the only way to stay ahead is to upgrade your weapons and your size. And this is how Dunkleosteus came to be. It was basically the final boss of this entire arms race era. The biggest estimates put it around 20 to 30 feet long, with a head that was practically a block of armour plating. Fish developed armour, and then fish developed stronger jaws to crush that armour, and in turn, fish developed more armour. And the cycle continued until you created Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus fossils have been found with bite marks from other Dunkleosteus jaws, which is more evidence of these apex predators eating each other. Most arms races were just animals against their own kind, forcing them to evolve bigger and bigger until their bodies couldn't practically be any larger. If you've been paying any attention, you'll notice this is a common pattern we keep seeing throughout prehistoric eras. The apex predators become apex by simply growing larger and larger until they're giant versions of themselves, and then their only competition is each other. First, the oceans made the giant orthocones, then it made giant scorpions, then it made giant armoured fish. Essentially, almost all builds could become apex predators for their time period. They just need to be the first ones to evolve into giants. Now, fast forward hundreds of millions of years. By the late Cretaceous, the top predators weren't weird cones or plated tanks anymore. Instead, they were reptiles. The Cretaceous oceans were enormous and shallow all over the world. Warm water, high sea levels, and massive reef systems created some of the most productive marine ecosystems ever. With that much life in the water, predators could grow absurdly large because there was always something giant to eat. And as the ocean filled with more giants, the only way to compete was to also be a giant. All the sores you've ever heard of, like mosasaurs, chronosaurs, and even land dinos were running rampant, pushing the size race to grow even bigger. And again, this isn't like polar gigantism. Oxygen levels weren't even that much higher than they were now. You just had to be big to compete. And this is exactly what happened to the cute turtles then. This is Archelon, the largest sea turtle to ever exist. 
Archelon was over 13 feet long, with a shell wider than most cars and flippers built for crossing entire oceans. It wasn't big because of oxygen or temperatures, it was big because the Cretaceous Ocean was a battleground of monsters, and you had to be a monster to live. But here's the big question still. If these giant builds were so successful, why did they all die out? Where are the giants today? Well, the most obvious thing that removed them was extinction. When you get absolutely nuked by a giant asteroid, it wipes and resets the whole playing board. Even if Mosasaurs were strong, they'd have to evolve again after getting wiped out. Today's world is only 66 million years old, compared to the 150 years that the Mesozoic lasted. This time, mammals took over. In modern day, with colder oceans and less giant abundances of food in the ocean, it's not as easy for these massive reptiles to survive. But let's assume that the climate was the same, and you spawned a bunch of mosasaurs into today's oceans. Would they start dominating the oceans once again as top apex predators? Not really, and it isn't just because of food. Reptilian gigantism has basically stopped existing, and there are a bunch of reasons for that. First, modern oceans are dominated by warm-blooded hunters like orcas, sperm whales, and fast-moving sharks. These animals can chase, sprint, and outmaneuver almost anything. Second, most ecosystems just don't support that scale anymore. Prehistoric reptiles got huge because there were giant prey items everywhere. Giant amenities, giant turtles, giant fish, giant everything. Once that all vanished, the entire reptile super predator blueprint went extinct with it. Reptiles simply don't fill that role today, and evolution hasn't pushed them in that direction for tens of millions of years. And third, today's food webs are tighter and leaner. Being a 40 to 50 foot reptile means burning massive amounts of energy. And unlike whales, reptiles can't use thick blubber, warm blood, or crazy efficient oxygen use to thrive in cold water or during long migrations. You can also include a fourth that there's no chance humans would let mosasaurs suddenly start running around rampant but I excluded us from this hypothetical. But as you might know, marine gigantism didn't fully disappear. It's just not the same as it was in prehistoric times. Some descendants of these giants are still with us, hiding in plain sight. The leatherback sea turtle might not be as heavy as Archelon, but still reaches over 2,000 pounds. The giant squid still grows over 40 feet, and the blue whale is still the largest animal to ever live on Earth, bigger than anything the prehistoric oceans ever produced. The giants today are just different, and are much more niche compared to the giants of the past. We don't see giant lizards or giant scorpions anymore, but the arms race never fully ended. Giant squids evolved to grow longer and stronger to compete with other predators. Sperm whales evolved into the largest predator on the planet, designed to chase those same massive squids. We still see these same patterns play out today, but with different animals than previous ecosystems. But if another extinction level event happens, who knows? We could see giant dolphins next. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, check out our video on polar gigantism here.